Hi everyone, my name's Lou, and today I'm going to talk to you about in-person or tabletop games. We'll start with a definition of tabletop games. It refers to a variety of in-person games, like board games, card games, dice games, tile games, and my personal favorite, role-playing games. So let's talk history. People have been playing games for a ridiculously long time. Some of the oldest games are the Egyptian game Senate, which dates back to around 3500 BC, the royal game of Ur, shown here, and precursors to backgammon and chess. Wait a minute, this is a lot of history to cover, so let's jump ahead. Basically, every invention that made printing and manufacturing easier also made creating games easier. So let's focus on recent history. In the mid-90s to early 2000s, European games like the Settlers of Catan and Carcassonne became popular. A lot of American games, like Monopoly and Life, are primarily luck-based. You know, you roll the die, you land on a spot, and you accept the consequences. These Euro games, on the other hand, are strategy-based, and they became so popular that they shifted the whole gaming industry away from luck-based games. In 2009, Kickstarter, the popular crowdfunding website, was launched, which has allowed more people the opportunity to create games. A lot of the games I'll be talking about in this presentation actually got their start on Kickstarter. We know that people have been playing games forever and don't seem to be stopping anytime soon. According to a market research report, the board games industry is expected to reach more than $12 billion by 2023, growing at a compound annual growth rate of over 9%. With the industry growing and crowdfunding it making it possible for just about anyone to publish a game, how do you keep track of what games people are playing? There are a few different ways. Amazon has lists of bestsellers, new releases, movers and shakers, and most wished-for items by category. There are also websites dedicated to board games, such as Games Radar and Board Games Quest. As far as awards go, the Spiel des Jahres, or Game of the Year award, is really the big one. Amazon's lists appear to be created automatically based on sales and other data, and are therefore able to be updated very frequently. Because Amazon is such a widely used marketplace, these lists are best for seeing what games appeal to the average person rather than a tabletop gaming hobbyist. The lists, however, are cluttered by multiple versions of the same games, as well as items that have been poorly categorized. Game websites are created by people who really like games. They usually consist of lists and articles about games, and talk about current and upcoming trends. The lists also tend to focus on narrower categories, like specific genres or playstyles. These websites focus on what games appeal to hobbyists rather than the more casual game players. The Spiel des Jahres Award was started in 1979 by German game critics. In addition to the Game of the Year Award, there are also awards for Children's Game of the Year and Expert Game of the Year. 2019's winners are Just One, a cooperative word-guessing game, Valley of the Vikings, where players roll a ball to knock down plastic barrels, and Wingspan, a card-driven game featuring hundreds of tokens, cards, and dice. I used all of the resources I just mentioned when researching this presentation, and I noticed two main trends. A lot of the most popular games feature Eurogame-style strategy and include elements of tabletop role-playing games, such as playable characters and detailed figurines. I also noticed a lot of franchise tie-in games, but on closer inspection, these turn out to also feature Eurogame-style strategy and elements of tabletop role-playing games, so I guess it's really just one trend. When building a tabletop games collection, it's also important to remember that classics never go out of style. There's a reason that games like Uno, Monopoly, Scrabble, and Sorry are still manufactured and sold. Even older games like Chess and Go are good to have on hand. So I'm going to focus on newer games popular with different age groups. Unfortunately, the popularity of strategy-heavy Euro games has meant that there haven't been as many new games aimed at younger children. The most popular games for this age group tend to be classics like Shoots and Ladders and Candyland. The Sneaky Snacky Squirrel game was one of the only newer games on the popular lists. Because it uses a color rather than words, it's a game that even very young children can play. There are more options for children ages 8 to 12. The hottest games for older children include Codenames, Exploding Kittens, Quirkle, and my personal favorite of the bunch, Ticket to Ride, an easy-to-learn game where players build train routes across a map of North America. Here are some other games for this age group. We have Sequence, Bananagrams, Azul, Bushido, Throw Throw Burrito, and Sushi Go. A lot of the most popular games right now are aimed at teenagers and adults who are better able to handle very complex strategy games. These games include Pandemic, Betrayal at House on the Hill, and The Resistance, a game that shows you which of your friends are good at lying. 
Some other games for this age group, Mysterium, Seven Wonders, Root, Dominion, Cthulhu Death May Die, and The Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. Tabletop role-playing games, or RPGs, are a little different than most board games, although as I mentioned, board games are starting to include elements of RPGs. In an RPG, players each control and act as a specific character. These characters have attributes and statistics that help guide how they interact with the world of the game. One person acts as the game master and runs the game. In general, RPGs come in the form of books and individually purchased accessories rather than as a boxed set. The most popular tabletop RPG is Dungeons & Dragons. It was originally published in 1974, but the most recent edition, the 5th edition, was published in 2014. D&D has gained popularity recently due to its appearance in the Netflix show Stranger Things and the web series Critical Role, in which voice actor Matthew Mercer runs a D&D game for other voice actors. So how are libraries approaching tabletop game collections? There are three main approaches that I've found. The first is creating a circulating collection of tabletop games. This allows patrons the freedom to play games in their own homes on their own time, but it comes with the risk of damaged games and missing pieces. Some libraries keep their games in-house and allow patrons to play them in designated area. While it's less likely that the games will be damaged or lost, it's less accessible to patrons who, for example, work during library hours. Regardless of whether the games circulate or remain in-house, a lot of libraries with game collections are also doing game programming. One-off game nights, ongoing game clubs, and library-hosted RPG sessions are the most common programs. Thank you for listening to me ramble about one of my favorite hobbies. These are the sources I used in my research. I will also link to them all in the video description for easier access.